Okay, we'll get it started. Happy Tuesday. Um, welcome back. Today, we're obviously talking about the big changes coming up here with the NAR policy changes and um, bright rules changes as well as, um, you know, just all these forms, new forms that came out from PAR. So to kick it off, I know this stuff can be daunting and overwhelming and um, people sometimes uh, dwell on what ifs and make this thing bigger than what it is to kind of shrink everything down and put it in perspective. They're really, in our opinions, two big main changes. One, you're no longer going to be able to advertise cooperating broker compensation in Bright MLS. Um, or any other website that has an IDX feed from the MLS. So two, you're also gonna need to have a buyer agency agreement in place before you ever show a property to a client. So you have to have one of those in place to show property. Those two things are the big main changes. Um, a lot of the other principles and uh, policies and stuff like that we've been operating under for years and years are still out there. Um, so we're obviously going to get into that in more detail, but I wanted to bring that up up front. And um, we're, we're going to go through a couple different parts here today. We're not going to go through all of it because obviously it is huge and there's a lot of different forms. But we're going to start here with the notice to policy changes, the MPC form from PAR. Um, then we're going to work into the listing agreement, the agreement of sale, and the cooperating broker compensation form. So that's our agenda here today. Uncle Tim, I see you have your hand up. Please unmute and ask your question. I think I am unmuted, aren't I? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So be before we get started on these forms, First of all, thank you for everybody getting on this call right now. We have 34 um, uh, different blocks of people and some of which have multiple people in them. So we probably are close to 40 people watching this video right now. What I'd like to say is, you know, as you've seen in my emails, the, the boys and I and Aaron, we, we've spent six hours last week on this. We spent two hours again yesterday with an open session in the office, which was very good dialogue, coming up with actually more questions that we're going to ask Brett Woodburn about next Tuesday at the West Shore Country Club for that breakfast meeting. So if you have, I, I wanted to bring this up before people start jumping off the call because they got to go somewhere. Um, I want to let you know again, next Tuesday, we're having that breakfast meeting. But just to let you know the schedule and how we are going to proceed with this training is we're going to do uh, what we have scheduled to do today. On Friday, we're going to actually have Jeff Arnold. I, I don't know if Barbara Grog is going to get on the call with him or not. We're going to try to get her on with us from, is it called American Home Funding? New American Funding. New American Funding. But that company has a lot of uh, representatives that work with a lot of our agents. And we just want to get the lender's perspective um, as to what they're going to be working on and what they're willing to do with regards to compensation and, and, and concessions which you'll understand more of when we get into it so the schedule this week is this zoom call today then a call with a lender on friday next monday we're going to do a question and answer session about what you've read and what you've learned so far and we're going to talk about whether we can answer those questions or we're going to say to you that's a great question to write down and ask brett woodburn tomorrow so that we are prepared to ask as many questions as possible to the attorney um, who's part of the hotline system. So Mondays is going to be a question and answer period of things that are running through your head that either we're going to be able to answer or we're going to say, that's a great question, put it in, on, in writing and let's ask Brett tomorrow. Then, so that'll be Monday and Tuesday. Then next Friday, we're going to go over the buyer broker and non-exclusive buyer broker form in detail so that we're not starting at zero every time for those that made the meeting yesterday. We're not starting at zero. We're gonna to start to go through these forms and the changes. So today, what we're gonna to try to accomplish is go through the MPC form, if you have a copy of that, 
which is going to be the form that we need to start working with our buyers and sellers uh, as of August 1st through the 16th. From there, we're going to go into a couple other forms, cooperating broker form, and tell you how that's going to be now used. And then we're going to get into the listing contract and the two different changes to the listing contract that are major. And then we're going to briefly just touch on the sales agreement as to page two of the sales agreement changes that are in there that weren't in the agreement previously. So that's what the schedule is. Again, if you have a question, raise your hand. Brooks, go ahead and get started with the NPC form. Okay. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. There it is. All right, Kong, do you mind uh, running us down through here and we'll we'll get this thing started? Not at all, Brooks. Uh, can you hit the plus sign one yeah. time? There you go. Okay, so this NPC form stands for Notice of 2024 Policy Changes. So again, this is not a contract. It's not an addendum. It's a notice, okay? It's almost like the consumer notice. So it's for the client's uh, knowledge, okay? So the form starts off with uh, stating right at the bottom of it, for use with sellers or buyers, okay? So it's for both sellers and buyers who have existing brokerage relationships, whether it's through a buyer agency for a buyer or a listing contract for a seller, okay? And you'll notice the name of the broker there, licensee, and then client. So again, it's for buyer or seller. It doesn't designate that it's only for one side of the transaction, okay? Um, this notice briefly describes multiple listing service, MLS, policy changes implemented in August of 2024 that may affect contracts you have with your broker. Clients are encouraged to discuss these changes with their licensees and or broker to better understand their potential effects on transactions, okay? So the first uh, paragraph, cooperating compensation. Some sellers have listing contracts that authorizes a listing broker to make offers of cooperating compensation to buyer brokers. The 2024 policy changes prohibits these offers of compensation to be communicated throughout the MLS. So you were no longer to advertise in bright, okay? When the policy changes go into effect, any offers of cooperating compensation currently communicated in the MLS will be removed automatically without any change to the listing contract. If cooperating compensation is offered, Sellers should discuss with their broker what other means of communication may be used and how it would be negotiated between brokers. Okay, so this is just letting all the parties know that the multiple list service, MLS, will no longer be advertising the compensation to a buyer agent. Also, this means anything that gets feeds from the MLS, IDX feeds. Okay, showing time. We've had people ask, can we put it in showing time? So when somebody schedules a showing, it comes back with the the automated uh, okay to go show and then tells you what percentage it is. Can't do that. So we're going to have to communicate more with our co-brokes. Okay. Seller concessions. Some sellers are willing to consider negotiating financial assistance to help buyers pay for certain transactional expenses at settlement, including brokerage fees charged by a broker working with the buyer and or other ordinary and customary closing costs. This assistance has traditionally been referred to as seller assist, okay? But may be referred to as seller concessions after the 2024 policy changes. Any references to a seller assist in current contracts will be considered to be the same as a seller concession without any change to the contract. Buyers should discuss with their broker whether to modify their approach to potentially requesting seller concessions, which may require changes to their buyer agency contract. Sellers 
could discuss with their broker whether to modify their approach to potentially negotiating seller concessions, which may require changes to their listing contract. Okay. Three, buyer broker contracts. The 2024 policy changes require brokers who are working with buyers to have written agreements with those buyers prior to touring any properties. Let's read that again. The 2024 policy changes require brokers who are working with buyers to have written agreements with those buyers prior to touring any properties. Okay. These policies, along with Pennsylvania law, require that a buyer agreement describe the nature of the relationship, the services to be provided, and the fee to be charged. It must also state that the broker may not retain a brokerage fee in excess of the amount negotiated in that contract. If a buyer does not currently have a written agreement with their broker that complies with these policy changes, it may be necessary to amend the agreement or just sign a new one. Okay. Any questions there real quick? Okay. Uh, four, additional contract changes to be in writing. Any amendments to the, to the terms of existing contracts between client and broker and any new contracts must be in writing and signed initial by both the client and broker. Any, any amendments to existing agreements of sale between a buyer and seller must be in writing and signed initialed by both parties. Okay. Any questions on this form? It's pretty, it, it spells out everything that we need to do. Yeah. Considering this is all in red, can anybody tell me one of the main parts that's important to know about this form. Is there any volunteers that would like to tell us what the main part of this form is that's very important right now? Okay, Kong, it would be the fact that before you show a house, you got to have a buyer broker mm -hmm. form. It's, it is critical. It is a law now, right, to do that. Correct. Which you should have had beforehand, too. Right. right, but there are a lot of us that weren't. Because if you start showing this houses and you get into a company that might request you to send them a copy of your buyer broker form to see what your commission is, you better have one and not start the process at that point. Okay? All right, let's go on to the next one. Everybody realizes that's the NPC form. That's the form that's going to be need to be signed for any listing that you have and any buyer broker form that you have um, before this thing gets started on, whether it's, is it August 16th or 17th? One of those dates. Brooks, anything you'd like to say about that form too? Um, yeah. With, with, too? Yeah, I know. Yeah, um, the one thing I wanna bring up too, and I might have fibbed just a little bit in saying that there's only really two main changes. Um, Another big change is that in that paragraph that we just said or read, the broker may not retain a brokerage fee in excess of the amount negotiated in this agreement. So what I'm going to do is go through all my buyers and buyer agency agreements, do an audit of that and make sure you have them filled out properly. Um, we've seen it before where erroneously a fee amount does not get put in there um and if you don't make an amendment to that and um you just simply have them sign this uh mpc form you could be working for free in that you have a zero amount specified in there and you're not allowed to collect higher than that so if you have buyer agency contracts out there make sure you do an audit before august 17th and make sure you have the exact fees that you want to work for in that agreement. Keith had a question. Uh, what to do if a unrepresented buyer wants me to show my listing? 
So if you are the listing agent, you have a listing contract with your seller to make X amount, right? Um, you can go show the property if, if they're not, if they don't want, if the buyer does not want representation, um, but you can go show the property, but before you write the contract, you should ask them and go through the consumer notice, you know, at, at the um, showing and ask them if they want to get representation before you write up an offer. It's okay to write an offer unrepresented right. after you've gone through the consumer notice with them. And the reason you can do that as a listing agent is because you're being paid by your seller on, on the listing contract. Whatever amount of donuts or percentage that you're going to get, you're allowed to do that. Now, obviously, you're not going to start running buyers around yeah. that are unrepresented. That would only go for a listing that you particularly have that somebody wants to see and they don't want to be represented. But it is okay still to be to show a house to them. your listing to an unrepresented buyer. Yeah. Perfect example of this. Last week, I showed a buyer one of my listings, and I don't practice dual agency. Okay. So I told them they could get their own agent or on the contract, they would have to be unrepresented and they opted to be unrepresented. So that's how I turned in the deal. Keith, does that answer your question? So I'm sorry, I, sorry, I, I, I don't think it does. So it says, it says and, and it says, I know this isn't a final form or anything, but it says if a broker is working with a buyer, and that's that was my question. What does that mean, working with a buyer? If it's my listing and they call and I have to have a contract with them before I show it, that's the way I'm reading it. That's my my hang up here. Well, when you when you feel that call and they want to see it, the first question you're going to ask him is, do they have a broker agreement with another agent? If the answer is no, you're going to say, ask them if they want to be represented. And if the answer is no, you can say to them, I'm willing, I'm willing to show it to you, but then you're going to be unrepresented. Is that the way you want so it to be? So a showing is not working with a buyer. That's Correct. I guess is working with is, a buyer is when you have them under either. My an thought, exclusive buyer I, I agency or not it's exclusive. it's just confusing because yeah. sure. you know I don't want to do anything that's going to get in trouble and right. it's ambiguous because the way I read that in order to show that person my listing I have to have an agreement with them and they may not want it I don't know maybe I'm just making more of a deal of it than yeah. it is and to Sherry's question but in the case of an unrepresented buyer you would still need to need them to sign a non exclusive form. Um, are you talking about a non-exclusive buyer agency form, Sherry, or what form are you talking about? No, you can actually get them to sign a unrepresented form. There is a... Do they have one now? Yes. Okay. So... If Where the buyer acknowledges or the client acknowledges that they are not being represented. So probably the best practice in that would be, and that's a good a question we could ask Brett on Tuesday... But the best best practice would be is when you meet them to show them the house, get them to sign the unrepresented form. So you're having them acknowledge they don't want to be represented. So Kong, the, the non-representative form, that's a different form that we haven't seen yet. Uh, it's always been in existence because um, mm -hmm. the contract, the agreement of sale has always, you could always check mark at the very top of every um, box under seller and buyer where you put their their names or I'm sorry, where you put the agency's name, it always says buyer is not represented or seller is not represented. You can always check mark that, but always have that form that says uh, clients, uh, the buyer unrepresentation form, I believe it is. It, it's so it's out under our, okay, because yeah. the NAR settlement, specifically what I'm reading says before a buyer is shown a property. So that's a little different than what Keith asked. Keith said an unrepresented buyer and working with a buyer. What does working with a buyer mean? That's different. 
the NAR settlement says before showing a home. So that means before you open the door, even if you do a virtual tour, doesn't matter if you're physically with them, but even a virtual tour, it says they need to be provided something. So would the form you're talking about suffice? Yes, I, I would think so. But that'll be a question for Brett Woodburn. Aaron, can you get into zip forms and see if you can find this non-represented form that we can share on the screen? I'm looking for it right now. Okay, great. Let's go on to the next question then. And again, that'll be that'll be a question we can ask Brett Woodburn. So Sherry, uh, yeah. if you could write down that question um, for Brett, in the meantime, we'll look for that form. The I'm next, writing uh, the questions down too, just so we all have it on one list, but yeah. Yep. Joe Schutz's question says, should the buyer agency form then say 5% if the commission is higher than normal so you ensure you get paid? Um, we'll go over that when we go over the buyer agency form. I, we're just, right. I just don't want and, to complicate and we, things we right can't, now. We can't represent anybody to uh, use a figure. Um, you can put in any amount of percentage or donuts, as Hank Lerner called them, in that form that you feel comfortable working for. But uh, if you want to put a higher than normal amount in that form, we talked about that yesterday, you can do that. There's some agents that aren't going to do that, but that will normally, the answer to your question is yes, it will normally make sure that you get paid whatever the amount is that's being offered by the listing agent, because there's not going to be that many listing agents that are offering four or five donors. Uh, J.C. Kell, when and where will these new forms be available? It'll be available on ZIP forms, I believe, August 17th? No, they're going to come out Around the 1st, I think. Around or August about 1st. the 1st. Right. Yeah, but they're not going into effect till that time. Yeah. yeah. Kara Schaefer, if a buyer chooses to be unrepresented, does that open us up to liability? Yes, if you don't have that form uh, where the client acknowledges that they do not want to be represented. And that's only going to be, for instance, somebody wanting to look at your own listing because you're not going to go show buyer's houses that are, want to be unrepresented. Um, I wouldn't think so. People aren't working as sub-agents for the sellers. Um, so it's only when you're showing your own listing. But if this form exists, I never used that form before. I always just marked on the contract that it was unrepresented. Um, so Sherry, if you found that form, uh, can you email that to Aaron or Brooks and then they can share that on the screen? I'm downloading it right now. Just give me a okay. second and I should be able oh, you to found it, Brooks? for us. Yeah. Okay. Diane, Leslie, you had your hand up for a second. Did you have a question? Well, I did. So if a buyer, if we want to represent the buyer, there is a form, isn't there, that we, for just that one property, that they would only have buyer representation on? Um. There is a form that says. Yeah, you know, Diane, you're talking about the non-exclusive, I believe. So we'll, we'll be see. going over that eventually, too. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. So this would be, Colin, if you want to go over it, this would be the form yeah. that we would have signed for a buyer who wants to look at your listing without uh, being represented by an agent. Right. Non-representation, acknowledgement, um, broker, licensee. Buyer has read and received the consumer notice. So that's important too. They they have received that uh, document as adopted by the uh, State Real Estate Commission. Okay. So they have read and received it. Surprisingly, okay. it doesn't say signed as well, but they have read and received it. Well, uh, some refused to sign it, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Does buyer have a business relationship with another broker? Yes or no? If yes, explained. Okay. Buyer is not represented by a broker. Broker listed above is a seller agent as described in the consumer notice who works exclusively for the seller and must act in the seller's best interest. Okay. Yeah, it's a pretty simple form. That's, I guess, the form then that should be presented to people who do not want to be represented in the transaction where if they're coming to see your listing, they don't want you to be a dual agent. Right. Okay. Well, I skipped over one of the big things right in the middle, top center. This is not a contract. Right. So it's a notice. Yep. It's an acknowledgement. Right. So, yep. 
Brooksy, if you could put on the screen now the cooperating broker compensation form. All right, give me one second here. Yep, no problem. Here we go. Okay, so we've all used this form for years, um, and it was typically presented to the listing agency at the time that you wrote the offer or shortly after, should have been at the time you wrote the offer. And you were at that point putting in the percentage of commission that you expected to be paid that was represented in the MLS. It's no longer going to be represented in the MLS anymore. Okay. Yeah. So our idea, as far as the company goes, is that this form be filled out at the time you take the listing. Now, it used to be part of zip forms in our buyer global package, because as you wrote an offer, you would fill in this form. We're going to add this now, this form to the listing global package so that when you take a listing and you're typing out your forms for your listing, you're going to put in this form if your seller is willing to pay a buyer's agent a commission. So when a property is scheduled to be shown through showing time, our idea is that when that agent schedules the showing, the email comes to you and it's going to also come to the office that we're going to have noticed that somebody wants to show your listing. At that point, we're willing to help you Monday through Friday from eight to five. And if the showing was scheduled during that period of time, and we will email this form to the showing agent and to you showing that we emailed it to them. If it's after five o'clock or on the weekends, you will need to email this form to the, the buyer's agent that wants to show your property so that you're showing them whether or not your agent or your seller is willing to pay a commission or not willing to pay a commission. Okay. Does anybody have a question on that? It's very simple. It's basically the same way as before. We're just showing the agent. It, it's our job now that it's not going to be in the MLS to market and advertise to the other agents, whether we're paying a commission or not. And if your seller is still willing to pay a commission, which most sellers will, because it's the way business has always been done, we're simply showing them up front how much we're willing to pay. Again, if you don't have any questions, Brooks, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? one no i i don't have anything on that one i think but we're yeah. good Any questions or comments on that one yeah i have a question well comment yeah i think i think your idea is awesome about you know once the filling is set up to help us out and get that information to the uh, buyer's agent so the first paragraph at the top where it's in red it's kind of interesting because i'm thinking in my mind what if we want to negotiate something different so it says that um it can be renegotiated after an offer is executed, but cannot be negotiated as a term of the offer. So basically, whatever this is set in stone, that's how our offer would be submitted. We know we're getting three donuts. But after it's executed, if there are inspection issues or an appraisal issue, then at that point, it sounds like we can modify this. Is that right? Yes, that's my understanding in it. And when I read it as a term of an offer, that means it can't be written into the offer, um, a change to it. Now, we'll, when we get to the offer, you're going to see on page two of the new agreement of sale, the buyer, when they fill it out, if he's not willing to accept the commission amount that's on this form, there's a spot on page two that says, in addition. And that's going to be a very important thing that we're going to talk about when we get to the agreement of sale but it can be changed or negotiated during the initial offer too. But it can be renegotiated after an offer is executed. Like you said, Sherry, that if we're dealing with repairs and everybody's contributing to the thing, it can be renegotiated. So you are correct. If so, there's anybody that has a question with regards to the last um, part of the last sentence where it's comma, but cannot be negotiated as a term of the offer, then that's a question we'll probably have to have for Brett Woodburn. So one thing to note when you 
look at the cooperating broker compensation agreement, it says not to be used as an addendum to agreement of sale. And the reason why it's not an addendum to the agreement of sale is no client signs this, right? The only people signing this form are the two brokers, okay? So keep that in mind. This is a broker to broker form, not clients have nothing to do with this, okay? What happens is when you have a listing contract, the seller agreed to pay you, the listing agent, 10 donuts, okay? And within that listing contract, you told the seller that, you have 10, if you're giving me 10 donuts, I'm giving the buyer agent five donuts. Okay. So this form again is between the brokerages. Now, when we get to the agreement of sale, what the section that Tim's talking about, the seller is paying in addition to. Okay. So just keep that in mind. Okay. And, and to just expand on what Kong's saying, Let's assume that the seller was paying a total commission of four donuts, okay? And the listing agent was keeping three and only paying out one on this cooperating broker compensation form. And let's say that you were not willing to accept one donut. So on page two of the new agreement of sale, there is a paragraph in there that was never in this agreement of sale before, okay? And in that paragraph, it says that in addition to cooperating broker compensation that's being offered, they want X amount of donuts. So they might ask for in the offer two donuts in addition to the one that's being offered so that they get three and the listing broker gets three. So that's where we're talking about Gong, the, the, the compensation being changed or that's the only way it can be part of the term of the offer is if what's in this buyer or compensation form isn't enough for you, you would either need to then in, enforce your buyer agency agreement or two, add it to page two in the in addition column, correct? Right. Okay. okay. Correct. So just keep that in mind, okay? It's always, every time I see a form, I always look at the end, who's signing this form and that tells me what it's all, you know, what I need to do to better understand the form. Okay. If nobody has any questions on this one at this point in time, or if they do have a question they want to ask Brett Woodburn, please write it down. Let's go, Brooks, to the listing contract, seller agency contract. All right. There we go. All right. There's really not a whole lot of changes on page one. What we need to focus on is page two, number six. Okay, so either Kong or Brooks, and we, we want to take the lead on, on how this works with the compensation and the seller concessions. Sure. Cooperating compensation offered to brokers working with buyers, number six. Okay, listing contract. A, licensee has explained seller's options and company policies regarding compensation and cooperation with other brokers. In a transaction where a buyer is working with a real estate broker, seller authorizes and instructs broker to offer cooperating compensation in the amount of blank percent or flat fee of from the purchase price, zero if not specified, paid from the broker's fee to a cooperating broker who is procuring cause of a successful transaction. Broker will document the agreed upon amount by using a form such as the cooperating broker compensation agreement, the CBC form that we just went over, or a similar agreement. Even though a cooperating broker's fee or a portion of it may be, may be paid by the listing broker, the cooperating broker will continue to represent the interests of the buyer. Okay. B, right. the rules of the multi-list service, MLS, do not permit brokers to advertise cooperating compensation through the MLS or in any other system or platform that utilizes data supplied by the MLS, the IDEX feed. C, 
seller authorizes broker to advertise or otherwise inform potential buyers and their brokers about any offer of cooperating compensation via any other method of marketing or communication authorized by this contract, unless otherwise stated here. Okay, let's move to number seven. Okay. Seven, seller concessions. Sellers sometimes offer to make financial concessions towards paying buyers closing costs at settlement. Seller concessions could be used to pay any costs incurred by buyer as acceptable to a mortgage lender, if any, including brokerage fee charged by a broker working with the buyer and or other ordinary and customary closing costs. Any seller concession must be negotiated and included in an agreement of sale to be binding on the buyer and seller. Even though a cooperating broker's fee or a portion of it may be paid by a seller, the cooperating broker will continue to represent the interest of the buyer. A, in addition to cooperating compensation offered by broker, if any, seller is willing to consider ne negotiations in which buyers may request seller concessions unless otherwise stated here. B, seller authorizes broker to advertise or otherwise inform potential buyers and their brokers about seller's willingness to negotiate seller concessions, including a maximum amount of up to blank percent or a flat fee of from the purchase price, amount is fully negotiable in an agreement of sale if not specified via the MLS or any other method of marketing or communication authorized by this contract, unless otherwise stated here. Okay, so what that means um, to you, and hopefully everybody's focused on this, is there will be some agents in our MLS that are going to offer a cooperating compensation, which is part of your um, brokerage fee that you've charged on page one. On page two, like we used to have, we would put what we were willing to pay. This is the same thing. We're willing to pay this. Although now we also have this seller compensation concessions part in which is still allowed to be advertised in the MLS. So some agents will choose. It's, it's their option as to whether they want to offer it as compensation or concessions. So if they offer three donuts in concessions, then that three donuts or whatever that percentage of will be represented in the multiple listing service that there is a concession amount for a buyer. Now, if you choose to do it that way, then what happens is, is let's say that the concession amount is one, one donut, okay? Just hypothetically. But your buyer agency agreement says that you're supposed to get two and a half donuts, okay? At that point in time, you would have the option of either accepting one donut and going on with the sale, or you would have to go back to your buyer and say, our agreement is for two and a half donuts. I'm only getting one donut, which means I need to charge 1.5 donuts to you on your buyer's cost sheet, okay? That's, it can happen that way too. And that way, it's all disclosed in the MLS if you want to do it under concessions. If you don't want to do it under concessions, then you would have uh, um, to do it under the cooperating compensation, which again is the form that we just literally went over. And we told you that we would send to um, the agents for the showing Monday through Friday from eight to five. Okay. So... Um, does anybody have any questions on how this works with concessions or versus compensation? It's pretty self-explanatory, um, but we'll get into that more in the agreement of sale. Kong or Brooks, anything you'd like to add to that or should we move on? I think one big thing that um, hasn't been discussed is the importance of having a seller cost sheet and a buyer cost sheet at your initial meeting too, just to show people what it's going to cost them to buy a house fully if 
There was no compensation offered or anything. Just a buyer cost sheet showing them what they should expect to pay. Okay. So, Brooks, if you could move on, since there's no questions, let's move on to the standard agreement of sale. And let's go to page two. And then that'll be the last form we're going to go over today. Then we'll ask some, we'll get into some questions if anybody has it. And then we'll be prepared for uh, Friday's call with the lender. Okay. All right, Kong, this is page two of the seller's agreement of sale. And let's talk about the um, changes that are in it. Sure. Um, yep. Number three, seller concessions. So there's two of them. Buyer broker fee and the closing cost assist. Okay. So A, broke buyer broker fee. In addition, the key word there, in, in addition to any other cooperating compensation negotiated between the brokers using the CBC form, okay, or via some other agreement, seller will pay the following fee. Let me repeat that. Seller will pay the following fee to broker for buyer on behalf of buyer at settlement. Blank, flat fee, or percent of purchase price, zero if not specified. So this is saying the seller is paying in addition. So earlier we said, if, if you have a CBC form, Cobro form, and it says in there, you're willing to pay the buyer agent three donuts and you all signed it, they go show the house, okay? They write up another offer, they write an offer with agreement of sale. And in this form, they put down that they wanted another two donuts. So now they're going to get five donuts, three from you and two from the seller. Okay. So you got to be very careful when you fill out this form. If you already have a Cobroke form signed, you need to really pay attention to that, that spot. Okay. In case it, it's changed. Tim, any comment on that before I continue? Yeah. So another way to say this would be if, if you're, um, if your commission was five donuts and you were willing to pay out, or let's say your commission was six donuts and you were willing to pay out three donuts, okay, on the co cooperating broker form, this is where you've got to make sure that whatever buyer's agent that writes an offer for you, if you're already in agreement to pay out three donuts, you cannot allow, allow anything to be written in A. OK, because if they put in they want three donuts and they don't understand these forms, that additional three donuts is coming from your commission, which means you're going to get zero. <laughs> so, you know, be very careful with inexperienced agents, because if they mark if they've agreed to the cooperating broker form and then they mark three A, three donuts, you're getting zero donuts. So that's where we're very concerned about making sure you understand what 3A means. That's the one that's really important right now. Right. Does anybody have any questions on that? Now, if 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 the to explain it another way, if your commission was four donuts and you were willing to pay out one donut, okay, and the cooperating form again showed one donut. If the, if the buyer's agent's not satisfied with the one donut, they could mark in this form in 3A that they want two donuts from the seller. That'll give them three. If you present that contract to your seller and the seller says, I'm not willing to pay two more donuts, then the buyer's agent at that point has to go back to their buyer, scratch that off, have to go back to their buyer and then renegotiate with them as to whether or not they're going to accept or pay the additional two donuts, or they're going to negotiate their buyer broker fee down from three. Does anybody have any questions on that? Diane Ramp? You have to unmute. Hello? 
Diane, you're waving your hand in front of the screen. <laughs> yeah, if any co-broke have an issue with this, tell them to read it, the first sentence, because right as of right now, it's in bold, and it says, in addition. Okay, it looks like Diane unmuted herself. Diane, your question? How is all this going to work when we have multiple offers coming in and all this, all these extra forms going around? Well, there's not a lot of extra forms. It's just the forms have changed. So when you get the multiple offer situation, you're going to know how many donuts you offered the um, cooperating agent. But it's going to be your responsibility to make sure now on page two of the agreement of sale, you're watching that block 3A, that you're not skipping over that. Well, actually, the, the, the easiest answer to Diane's question is on every multiple offer you get in, you should do a estimated seller's cost sheet. And that'll tell you who has the highest offer. Okay. Now, one thing, though, is remember the escalation clause, everybody's always like, well, what's this seller concessions minus seller concession net price and stuff? And we could never really get a clear. It was clear to some of us, but a lot of agents were like, well, what have you paid the transfer tax and stuff like that? Um, but now it clearly states right here, this is your seller concession right here. And that's what you subtract to get your net. Okay, guys, so the reason I wanted to end today's call with this form and then pick it back up on Friday is, Conger Brooks, can you explain what some of the concerns are going to be with some of the lenders where um, w when the market changes where it's already changed in certain areas, how the closing cost assistance and the cooperating compensation if it's coming in the form of a concession, could affect a lender. And that's why we're going to bring the lender in. Can you guys explain that a little bit? Yeah, Kong, do you want me well, to take it or do you want to take that? Let me read B first, and then you can explain it, Brooks. Okay. Let's read B, closing cost assistance, okay? Seller will pay the following amount towards buyer's closing costs other than a brokerage fee payable to broker for buyer, as permitted by the mortgage lender, if any, seller is only obligated to pay up to the amount or percentage which is approved by mortgage lender. Okay. So if you have down there 6% and the lender only allows for 5% closing costs, they lose 1%. Uh, is approved by mortgage lender and you can put in a flat fee or a percentage of purchase price. Okay. So Kong, if, if the age listing agent chose not to offer a cooperating broker compensation and the buyer was doing a 95% down deal. Okay. And they needed 3% closing cost help and they put 6% in there for the closing cost help. Mm -hmm. Now they're putting 6% in there that they're going to have to either pay out of pocket where they're trying to get from the, the seller. Well, why we're bringing the lender in is because there's going to be certain lenders that are going to separate that out. And there's going to be other lenders that aren't going to separate that out. And there's a lot of lenders that haven't done anything yet other than VA to allow that separation. Can you expand on that a little clearer than the way I just exp explained it. Right. Or Brooks. <laughs> I thought it was pretty clear. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I guess VA is definitely making policy changes in that given the the overall changes the nation's seeing right now, um, you know, they're going to have to amend their policies to allowing a veteran buyer to pay for a broker fee, um, you know, in, in a transaction because they don't really have a choice. So in the event they're not willing to offer anything, um, 
buyer has to have a means of going through with that transaction. So the VA is amending their guidelines and rules um, to allow them to pay for those transactional transactional fees that they otherwise couldn't before all these changes went into effect. Okay. So again, Friday's call, which is going to be at 9 a.m. or 9 a.m. on Friday, we're going to let the lenders know how these changes are going to affect them and what they're hearing in the background of what might possibly be amended to help us figure out how to handle this for a buyer if the seller is not willing to pay the commission and the buyer doesn't have any extra money. So uh, that's what I think we're going to talk about on Friday. Anybody have any questions as far as what we've gone over so far today? Sherry did share, just so um, everybody knows, they did. They are updating the multiple offer summary worksheet. So it is broken down to on there, um, the seller concession closing costs and seller concession buyer broker fee. So they're adding that on there for the multiple um, offer summary. Yep, I just opened it up and I see it. Looks good. So, um, Again, if nobody has any questions, we'll end the call here today. We're going to keep going over this. I will put out a schedule on what topics and what forms we're going to go over. Um, right now, our schedule is going to be to go over, again, um, the lender side of these changes on Friday at 9 a.m. Then Monday, I think, Brooks, unless you think we should do it in an office, I think we'll do it Zoom again because it allows more people to do it, especially if it's going to be a question and answer. So instead of being an in-office meeting, we'll do a Zoom of question and answers of anything you're thinking about during the next several days with regards to these changes so that we can try to answer them on Monday. And then Tuesday, we have the meeting with Brett Woodburn. And then Friday of that week, we'll go over the exclusive and non-exclusive buyer agencies. Does that sound like a plan, Brooks? Yeah, I agree. I think Monday um, being a Zoom definitely allows more people to get on and we can definitely do it that way. And then that way we get a feel for what questions you guys have and whether we can answer them before we get to Brett Woodburn. There were some good questions that came out of yesterday. So meeting, I know um, uh, Aaron Hubler and uh, Tracy Weigel and, and uh, Sherry had some good questions that I think we should uh, I had said to them, you know, write that down. Let's ask that to Brett when we get there. So I'm sure there's going to be things that you guys think of. I really appreciate everybody getting on the call today.